the Shivagamas are these scriptures which were revealed by Shiva, Mahadeva himself, the real Jews of Hinduism, which most people have forgotten now. Uh, so thanks, a big thanks to Rahul Ji and everyone at Shijan Foundation for inviting me here to give this talk. And my today's talk is on the Shivagamas. Um, and before I go ahead with the talk, I just wanted to mention that you know everything I know about Shivagamas, whatever I know, I've learned it from my Guru, His Holiness Paramahamsa Nityananda Swamiji. He is reviving the entire science of Shivagamas. So I will of course be sharing more about the Shivagamas, but this is a knowledge which is extremely ancient, which has been like lost for a very long time. And it is being revived now by my Guru, who I have been a disciple of for the last 10 years. So like Rahulji was sharing, uh, uh, I was working <coughs> with Shlambhaji since 2007. I worked for three years and then I quit my oilfield job and I started working in my creative line. And since then, it also awakened my own spiritual uh, seeking. And uh, so that's how I got into this whole realm of learning the real juice of Hinduism, which most people have forgotten now. So Hinduism cannot be separated from the spiritual aspect of it. And the spirituality cannot be separated from the ritual aspect of it. So that is what is very beautifully explained in the Shivagamas. This is my guru. So before I start the talk, I'll just start with a mantra. If you if you would like, you can chant along with me. Om Nityanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Jnana Murtim Dvandvatitam Gagana Sadrisham Tattvamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalamachalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavati Tam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bunaktu Sahaviriam Karvavahai Tejasvinavati Tamas Tuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 So, I'll first start with why should we even bother about Shivagamas? Why should you care about Shivagamas? When I say you, I mean anyone, right? So, in contrast with, you know, other traditions, uh, I don't know if I can even call them traditions, but in contrast with other uh, so-called religions, Hindu scriptures are not just books. That is the first thing we need to understand. That Hindu scriptures are not just dead books which store some facts or figures or do's or don'ts. That's not at all what they are. They are living scriptures. And they have the sacredness is because they are timeless. And why are they timeless? That is because they describe and they give us timeless cosmic truths. Right? So it is not just that they are describing some deity or they are describing just what you should do. But all of that is also again connecting back to living, radiating the cosmic truths. So all our scriptures are timeless for that reason. Not because XYZ said so, but because they give truths which are timeless. And these truths were revealed to the Rishis, Munis and other sages thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, the Shivagamas are these scriptures which were revealed by Shiva, Mahadeva himself. They are not like, you know, described as Mahadeva giving, they are, were given by Mahadeva himself. So, Mahadeva has walked on this planet many, many times in many, many forms. And these <coughs> set of scriptures were revealed at the Mount Meru by Mahadeva to his Saptarishis of that Yuga. So, in the beginning of the scriptures itself, very beautifully the description is given that Mahadeva is sitting in Samadhi at Mount Meru and the scripture and the sorry, the Rishis go and entreat him that, you know, you are all knowing, please bless us with this knowledge of how we can live like you, how we can radiate this, uh, you know, beautiful existence which you are living. How should human beings who are caught in this Maya, who are, who are you know, so confused about their existence, who keep 
getting caught in the same kind of problems again and again. How can we be free of those bonds? So this is the seeking with which the rishis go to Mahadeva and ask him to reveal the signs and the truths which can liberate them from this. This is how the Shivagamas were revealed by Mahadeva himself. And Mahadeva gives a vision document. He is not just saying do this and don't do this. No, that is a very mediocre logic. That is not the kind of logic which is contained in our dharma, in our Sanatan dharma. Mahadeva says, you have asked a very good question. Now let me reveal this entire science to you. So it is very, very important to understand that the insights, the truths, even the rituals, everything that is revealed in the Shivagamas is revealed with this purpose. It is very important to understand the purpose. Not just that, oh, because a lot of times, the reason why I'm mentioning this and emphasizing this is because a lot of times, a lot of these mediocre logic people come and just pick out one fragment of a verse and then they say, oh, you are told to offer this and not offer that. But they don't understand the purpose behind it. Right? So the purpose is very, very important because the Shivagamas start with the very purpose for which they were revealed. Right? So, because like I said, they are timeless, even the science which is revealed is timeless. Now, why many people come and ask a lot of times that, you know, they are so old and, uh, you know, will it be relevant to us now and all of that. Now, from that time when they were revealed to now, what has changed? The cosmic truths have not changed. But what has changed in that time? The attitudes of the people, the mental setup of the people the capacity of people to do tapasya, right? If we are told to sit without moving for one hour, how easy is it going to be for us to do that, right? The demography has changed, the topography has changed, the political structure is extremely different from what it used to be thousands, say 10,000 years ago. Overall, the dharmic ambience itself has changed, which is why there is so much discussion, there is so much so-called controversy around the relevance of scriptures. Now imagine 10,000 years ago, there was no controversy about whether we should study scriptures or not. There was no second thought current, is it important or not? We knew it was important. We knew what it was for, right? But now, because of this dharmic ambience itself is compromised, people even have this question that why should we care about Agamas, right? But the Shiva Agamas will answer you that also. So this is what has changed, but what has not changed is the relevance of the Shivagamas because you see Mahadeva is, is uh, you know, he knows how the minds of people work. The first question they will ask is, why should I do this? Right? Like how kids ask, right? You tell them, mat rakho, rakho. first thing they will ask is, why should I do it? Which is why Mahadeva, to resolve this question for all of us, first thing he starts is, let me tell you why you should do this. Right? So it starts with that very purpose. Now, um, just to give you an idea of where do the Shivagamas belong in the whole hierarchy of Hindu scriptures, Hindu scriptures are divided into three types, the Shruti, Smriti and the Itihas. Now the Shruti, it's very important to understand the relevance of Shruti. Shruti are the scriptures which were revealed directly as the cosmic truths which are you can say downloaded to the Rishis. So the Rishis were Mantra Drishta. Right? The Rishis were not just people who did tapasya and all that. They were, of course, they were enlightened, but they were mantra drishta. So, what does the word mantra drishta mean? Mantra drishta is somebody who can have the entire vision of a mantra. So, when Upanishads say, Ishavasyam vidagum sarvam, the Rishi is not just saying it verbally, he is seeing the whole cosmos when he is saying the Ishavasyam vidagum sarvam. Right? That is what a Rishi was. So when the Rishis wrote down, first of all, Rishis did not write it down initially. These were revealed to the Rishis who recorded it as the Shrutis. Now what were the Smritis? The Rishis who at that particular Yuga or at that point of time felt a need for a certain science or certain way of life to be revealed for those set of people. They recorded their own records of lifestyle, of other knowledge for those people. So Manu Smriti is one such scripture. Now there is a slight difference between Shrutis and Smritis because Smritis were actual experience of those Rishis. It's not like it is not relevant because their records are also relevant. I'll come to why. But they, it was at the end of the day, it was their own sharing, their own personal experience of the same, experience, of the same cosmic truths and how they have applied it 
at that point of time. So Manu Smriti, even the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, they were Smritis, they were not Shrutis. The Itihas were the Puranas, all the epics and all of those which record the history of mankind through different periods of time. Now, what is the relevance of all these scriptures? Where do they all fit into our current structure? So, the biggest question which uh, keeps going around around many times is anywhere any uh, you know Hindu ritual, any Hindu practice, even a Hindu belief is questioned. The first thing everybody has is where is it mentioned? How do you know it is a part of Hinduism? How do you even know your experience is authentic? If I say like, you know, my third eye is awakened and I can see through distances. The first question everybody has is how do you know it is not your imagination? Right? These are the kind of questions everybody has. And that is just whether you want to call it, uh, you know, the curse of current times or the reality of current times, you can call it what you want. But that is the kind of questions people have. Now, the scriptures demystify and resolve this problem also for us. Now, you can classify the scriptures into four categories. First is the Shastra Pramanas. The Shastra Pramanas are the original scriptures which were the Shrutis. The second is the Apta Pramanas which were the experience of all the Rishis who made it through different times. Like So, the scriptures have been revealed over many Yugas, right? not just 100 years or something, Yugas. Now, every Rishi of that Yuga has recorded something or the other of what he experienced. So, those accounts are called Atma Pramanas. Atma Pramana is your Guru. Whoever is the Guru from whom you are taking initiation, that is your Guru. So, the experience of your Guru is Atma Pramana. Sakshi Pramana is when you experience something. So, when you are experiencing something which has also been mentioned in the Atma Pramana, your own Guru has experienced it which is also experienced in by the rishis of earlier ages and which is also mentioned in the Shastra Pramanas, you know that it is most definitely a very authentic, timeless science. It is not that it was only relevant at a certain period. There are some things which may be relevant at a certain age and time, may not be relevant now. But there are the moment you know that something is, you know, sort of corroborated by all four, you know that there is there cannot be any doubt about its relevance. Now, the importance of Shrutis is because, see, in the age, in the, you know, ancient times, they did not have this pra practice of learning A for Apple. No, they, would, they weren't like, you know, they didn't have their head in their books. So, they didn't have like hundreds of files and folders and documents. They didn't use to, the education system itself was not for that purpose of making files and folders and books, right? The entire education was only by listening and the transmission of truths was only by listening because they were pre preparing enlightened beings. They were not prepa preparing like, you know, clerks, right? The entire Vedic parampara was with the emphasis on listening. It was not ki I am telling you the verse, you write it down. No, writing down the book will get enlightened. You will not get enlightened. You have to listen. You have to internalize. You have to like, you know, think about it, then you have to apply it. If you're not listening, the whole science is lost. What is the point if you're not going to listen only, right? So, Shruti was very, very important. And because in the ancient, ancient times, the rishis and, you know, the young students, they were such experts in listening that the moment something was, uh, you know, given to them, some mantra was given to them, they used to be able to memorize entire Shastra is from end to end. They didn't have to record it anywhere. It was verbatim, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation would be able to repeat it. And this is not just something I am saying. If you actually, uh, I'll of course be sharing more later, but if you actually see the Agamas, in the beginning of every Agama, it is mentioned who is asking for that, uh, you know, scripture to be revealed, which uh, Rishi is revealing it or which Rishi is describing it. And then he also gives the entire lineage of gurus, how it was transmitted from one generation to the other, to the other, to the other. And they all know, it's not like, you know, one, there will be one gap somewhere that, okay, after this, I don't remember who gave the science to whom. No, they will know the entire, if there were 28 gurus before him, they will know the entire 28. And the 28 will repeat it exactly the same way. So this is how the Agamas were revealed, which is why a lot of times we are not able to really, uh, you know, give the exact dated, uh, you know, the exact date line of when they were revealed, because for a very, very long time, there was no recording of it. 
nobody wrote down and people in those times used to live for like hundreds of years sometimes they were yoga purushas so you can't really fix their age as you know they must have been only 70 so you approximated like that it can't be done like that which is why we can't fix an exact timeline of when these scriptures were revealed so now we'll come to what is agam agam is that which is revealed right it was it is not that which is documented it is not that which is shared it is that which is revealed by mahadeva himself right now um agam is a word which uh, you know is used in many places now just before we go ahead i just want to clarify one thing the word is in sanskrit so anywhere else in english whichever spelling you use can be considered right or wrong based on who's reading it but the original word unless you write it in sanskrit everything else is uh, you know detail so all the english spellings you can think it's right it's wrong it's your choice but the original i'll only go by what is in sanskrit and even my pronunciation part of it is north indian style whatever i have learned myself and whatever i have learned from my guru will be south indian style so it will be a mix and match of both uh, so please accept it the way i am teaching it for now now agams are or agamas whichever way you want to call it are uh, of three categories the shivagamas the vishnu agamas and the shakt agamas now i will only be talking about shivagamas i am a shivite and so far i have only learned the shivagamas so i would only want to talk about that which i have learned right now the shivagamas were all the agamas which were revealed by mahadeva himself now we come to how were the agamas revealed now the kamika agama which is considered to be one of the most important agamas describes this so mahadeva has five faces now his five faces when he is giving the knowledge are the sadyojata vamdeva aghora tadpurusha and ishana now all these five faces further had five faces each so they were eventually 25 now from each face of mahadeva the laukika vedika adhyatmika atma ati marga and mantra agamas were revealed so these are not names these are categories right all these i'm just giving this as a description so you understand the length breadth and depth of the agamas they are not just one or two documents you will realize that more and more as i go forward they are an ocean right so laukik vedik adhyatmik atimark mantra are five categories of agamas which were revealed from each of the five faces now kamika agama gives total number of agamas as 25 but there are other additional agamas revealed from some of the faces this is also mentioned now i'll give a little bit of detail about which are the agamas now the agamas which were revealed from the sadyojata face are the bhut tantra and example is the kal tantra so this is an example of that vamadeva revealed the vam tantra the number in the bracket is what has been mentioned as the variations now i don't want to translate that any further big i'm just telling you as it is mentioned in the agama the aghora face revealed the bhairav tantra the tad purusha revealed the garud tantra and the ishana which is uh, the most important the ishana face of mahadeva is the face which gives enlightenment so the ishana revealed two types of agamas the rudra bheda and the shiva bheda the rudra bheda were 18 and shiva bheda were 10 now the shiva bheda the names are mentioned yoga chintya karan ajit dipt dipt sukshma sorry sukshma sahasra ashumam and kamika out of this the kamika is considered to be the most important so i wanted to go over this so you understand the the number of agamas and exactly how much detail they were revealed now i want to describe a little bit about the numbering in agamas because this is something which is very unique the numbering which we follow uh, in our normal arithmetic system ends at trillion right Be- beyond that we normally don't count like million billion trillion uske aage nahi aata right so now in the agamas there is a different word for every uh you know every power of 10 literally so from 0 to 1 to 10 100000 it goes on till 100 million trillion 
it is 100 million trillions is called parard so for literally every power increasing power of 10 there is a different word for it and that, there's a reason for it because the kamika agama has parard or 10 to the power of 20 verses it is and that is only one agama so only the kamika agama has 100 million trillion verses now some of the other agamas karan agama has 10 million verses Sukshma Agama has 1 billion verses. Sahasra Agama has 100 trillion verses. So this will give you an idea of the volume of these scriptures which originally existed. Originally word is very important here. Why? Because the Agamas we have now do not have this many verses. We lost all of that. Don't ask me how. We all have... Uh, reasonable knowledge of history by now we know how many attacks happened who all came and burnt what all and how many weeks which university and library burned we all know that right that is not what i'm here to talk about today but i wanted to bring this uh, to mention here to emphasize how much of our literature has been destroyed not lost just lost destroyed now many of these agamas actually exist in palm leaves and some of those palm leaves have been eaten by some insects or you know just weathering over time they are literally in palm leaves and they are now being digitized and revived and you know scanned and all of that some of these have first earlier been written by hand by some other people who are dedicated to dharma from palm leaves they wrote it by hand so some are existing as manuscripts and i'm not joking i actually have some of these manuscripts this uh, like you know the first slide you saw the screen the background was from a manuscript actually so these this is the ex the way in which these scriptures are existing today so you can understand how much effort goes into reviving these scriptures and of course uh, like i was saying swamiji is reviving all these and there is an entire team which is only dedicated to searching and digitizing and translating these scriptures so now I come to actually what is contained in the Agamas. I've built up a lot of, uh, you know, background on what is the Agamas and how they have been transmitted and all of that. Now what is contained in the Agamas? Now again, before I go ahead and explain what is there and what is not there, the purpose of everything in the Agamas was to realize the cosmic truth, which is Shivoham. You are Sadashiva. I am Sadashiva, right? Now, every Agama has four types of content. One is the Kriya Pada. Kriya Pada are all the rituals, all the practices, everything uh, like, uh, you know, Pran Pratishtha, like, you know, offering water, offering Achamaniyam, uh, doing the mudras, all of those things, everything which is can be contained broadly in the category of ritual or spiritual process, mm -hmm. that is the Kriya Pada. So Kriya Pada, this classification is actually mentioned in the Kamika Agama itself and at the end of every chapter it says which Pada it belongs to. Now Pada by the way is not step, it is part. So all four, four is it's not like you go step by step, not at all. These are four parts and all four have to be practiced. Charya is the lifestyle aspects. So for example, like uh, you know, when should you take bath, where should you take bath, uh, what kind of purification should you be doing? All those things which are lifestyle things. What should you be doing for brushing your teeth? To that detail, Mahadeva is given in the Agamas. So all the lifestyle things are the Charya Pada. Yoga Pada is literally rewiring your body to experience oneness, to experience the truth of Shivoham. So all the asanas, all the pranayama, dharan, dhyan, samadhi, everything, all everything that uh, you know, it goes with rewiring your body is the yoga pada. Jnana pada is the spiritual truths, all the knowledge which you need to realize everything in the cosmos. So, uh, Mahadeva's definition of jnana is not just knowledge, that's like a very weak word, but knowledge of realizing everything. By everything means also, knowledge is also the possibility of knowing everything. Everything means that's why Mahadeva is called Sarvagya, right? Sarvagya means the capacity to know everything. So knowledge here or jnana here is not just knowledge like, you know, what you read in books is also knowledge, but that's not the knowledge he's talking about. Knowledge of enlightenment and knowledge about knowing everything. How can you know everything? That is given. 
So, I'll just give a brief description of what is con uh, contained in the Kamika Agma because it is the biggest text which we have as of now. And then I'll go over some of the common understandings we have about Hindu rituals, Hindu practices and what does Mahadeva say about it. So, Kamika Agma has first of all the details of the mantra. Even before the mantra is actually, it gives the significance of every sound in Sanskrit. So, Sanskrit means the mala hoti hai. Literally every letter in the Varnamala has a spiritual significance. That is also given in the Kamika Agama. So every, in the beginning, Mahadeva describes very beautifully, every letter is associated with a certain color, a certain deity and produces a certain effect in the person who chants it. So that also is given. So uh, anybody who is curious about Sanskrit should definitely read this part of the Agama, where literally, uh, where, you know, every letter can give. So if you want to be rid of fever, you need to visualize a certain deity, a certain color and chant that particular letter. So it's literally to that extent, literally everything Mahadeva has given is like you know solution oriented. It is not just a dry ritual, it is solution oriented. When he gives you any ritual, he tells you what you will get from doing that also. So uh, then he gives the daily habits or the lifestyle, what all you should be doing, what time you should wake up, what time you should brush your teeth, which direction should you be facing. How should you do your puja? What should you make the linga out of? What all is an acceptable material for doing puja? It is not like you can go and offer popcorn in puja, right? So, what all can you can be given in puja? What kind of oil should you be using in doing your puja? To that detail, he has given instruction. He has not said do this, don't do that. No, he has given a whole classification. This is best. If you don't have this, use this. If you don't have this also, then use this. And then this last thing is the most preferable. And Mahadeva does not like this. Right? So, after all, you are offering puja to Mahadeva. You should be offering what Mahadeva likes, right? Not what you like. So, he has given that the vidhi to perform puja, the offerings in puja, what should the naivedyam be made of, how should you make the naivedyam. He has given the recipe of how should you make the naivedyam and what is the best item to use and how you can, like, you know, and he has given very simple material. It's not so difficult, it's just rice and how you can, like, you know, prepare the rice balls. He has given that. Then, now this is not all there is to it. He was a big visionary. So, he has gone into agriculture. When you start uh, tilling the land, what should that be made of? How should you be doing that, uh, tilling the land? Which direction should you be facing? Who is going to till the land? Is it the king? Is it the Kshatriya? Is it the Brahmana? According to that, he has given the processes. Town planning. He has given an entire, we talk about Vastu a lot these days, right? But nowadays Vastu is only limited to face this side and put this bed this side and put this window here and there, right? No, that is not the Vastu Mahadeva is talking about. Mahadeva has given an entire town planning on Vastu principles. So which direction should the roads be facing, which, which direction is the wind, which Varna should be living in which part of the town, which house should be made, how many stories high. What materials should go into the foundation? What materials should the house be built of? How to prepare the bricks and lay the bricks? That science is also there. So you would think that, you know, Mahadeva is just like, you know, he's just some god. He will just tell you, offer this puja, do this, chant this aarti, chant this mantra and done. No, he's given an entire everything a human being will possibly need to live his life. He has given how to align that to live enlightenment. Everything he has given. So any question you have, he has an answer for it. Before you can have a question, he has an answer. Before you can ask him what should the brick be made out of, he will tell you what the brick should be made out of. How do you lay the brick? Which mantra should be chanting? Should you be chanting when you lay the brick? It is in that detail. So I will not go into those details. You don't need to feel overwhelmed. But I'm just telling you to what depth he has gone when he has given this science. He has given details of construction of houses, animal shelters. He has given his own units of measurement of length, breadth, everything. And he has given, uh, so one thing is important that in the units of measurement, Mahadeva has not given a standardized unit. What he has given is even in measurement of time, it is based on the human being's capacity. So one breadth he has given as one unit of time, then this many is considered as that many minutes of time. So that. Translation, a lot of things get lost in translation when you move from Sanskrit to uh, English, people start translating it as this many minutes and this many hours. But in that time, it was not minutes and hours which were used. 
So for everything, he has not just given the process, he has also given the units of measurement. And it is not that, okay, it is only centimeter and then, you know, that's it. It, it has several, as, like, you know, have several dimensions to it. In the construction of temples, of course, he has given all the details from the pillar to the podium to the Garbhagriha to the Gopuram. Each thing is a separate chapter. There, is, there are 78 chapters in the Purva Pada of Agama, Kamika Agama and 45 chapters in the Uttar Pada of Kamika Agama. And of course, installation of deities and characteristics of deities. So, now I'll come to the most fundamental thing. What is a mantra? Now, I'll just go over some aspects of Hinduism and what we understand of it today versus what is mentioned in the Agamas and what does Mahadeva have to say about it, right? How far are we from what was originally, originally revealed to where we are today. Now, according to Mahadeva, not a single activity is performed without a mantra. And this is not what I am saying. This is not my opinion. This is what he has explicitly said. Mantra mina kriya nasti. There is no action which can be done without a mantra. For everything, there is a mantra and he has given those mantras. So, he has said that manana or contemplation, if I roughly translate it to uh, English, is the ability to know everything and trana is liberation from everything, all the ills, bondages in the samsara. Since the mantra gives both the ability to know everything and the capacity to get liberated from everything, it is called a mantra. That is the meaning of the word mantra. Now, since we are talking about meaning, he has also given another aspect to it which is the mantra consists of two parts, which is the vachya and the vachak. Now, the form of the word is the vachak, what you are pronouncing, what you are saying. So, the in the Sanskrit, it actually says the vakya. So, it is like whatever you are literally chanting is that, it is a vachak. And the form of uh, the deeper meaning, whatever you are supposed to realize from that mantra, whatever you are supposed to experience from chanting that mantra is called the vachya. Now, any mantra always has both these parts. It is not that you will just chant. It is not just literal chanting alone. It is the deeper meaning of the mantra which you are going to realize and which you will experience and which you are supposed to experience. So, every mantra has both these aspects. Now, I will come to the types of puja. Now, there is uh, recently, I, I don't know, a few months ago, there was a big uh, controversy and discussion going on amongst intellectual groups on, you know, how do we know puja is a part of Hinduism? Where does it say Hinduism is a part of Hinduism? So, all these people need to go and read the Kamika Agama. I am not even saying read all the Agamas. Just read the Kamika Agama. Mahadeva gives a very beautiful description of puja. What is the purpose of puja and what are the types of puja? Puja is of two types. One is the Atmartha puja and the second is the Parartha puja. Now, whatever you know as your personal deity, the Shivalinga you keep as your deity or if you have some other deity which you have, uh, which you worship to, which you pray to every day, that is the Atmartha puja. Parartha puja is the puja you offer to the deity for the public in the temple. So, the process is different and the same people cannot do both the pujas. So, in the sense that for doing the puja in the temples, you need a certain kind of knowledge and a certain initiation. Without that, you cannot just go and start doing the puja in the temple. You can't do that, oh, I do this puja every day. I do puja to Mahadeva every day in my house. So, yeah, it's okay. I'll go and do it in the temple also. It doesn't, it's not like that. You need to have a certain training or certain knowledge and initiation uh, into the Shiva Diksha before you can do puja in the temples. This is what Mahadeva has said. Whether we are following it now or not is another question. But this is what Mahadeva wanted. This is what he has said should be done for the society to prosper. So the Atmartha Puja gives the benefits to the person who is doing the worship. Now the Atmartha Puja has very he has very clearly said it is for fulfillment of your own desires. He has not said come and do puja to me so I can feel great. No, the purpose of puja was the fulfillment of your desires, what you want. That is why he has used the word swarth. Now, swarth here is not 
translated as selfishness. It is a Sanskrit word and Sanskrit words cannot be translated in this black and white form. So the Swarth here means Swa plus Earth for your own purpose. So whatever you want to manifest in your life for that you do Atmarth Puja. Um, then we come to the offering of Naivedyam. So Mahadeva has given very like you know explicit instructions on how to prepare Naivedyam and all of that. But before he goes into all of that, what has he mentioned? That you, the devotion and the love with which you prepare the Naivedyam is the most important thing. This is what he has said. He has said you should use the resources which are available to you and whatever you prepare in the house, any food you have, any flowers you have, anything, first offer it to Mahadeva and then use it for your own consumption. Now this used to be a very common practice till I think one generation ago. So like till one generation ago, I have seen my grandparents and my parents like you know, like right? So first we will offer it as uh, you know to the deities and then we will have the prasad as the whole house. Right? Now of course th those traditions are dying out. We did not used to know why we do that and nobody, um, it's just how things are that uh, because people did not know the relevance of it, those traditions started dying out. But before a few generations before people did not have this question that why should we offer to the deity first right that is how we did things that whatever we prepare first we go and offer it to the bhagwan because you know he is the most important part of our lives we first offer the best we have to the best we have in life and then we all share and eat together now mahadeva has said um, in the next verse uh, he is mentioned that Whatever you offer to Mahadeva will multiply in your life. This is what he has said. And whatever you don't offer will not multiply in your life. So he has given a very simple reasoning for it. Because why? Mahadeva is the ultimate. Whatever you offer to the ultimate is only going to grow and prosper. So he has mentioned this as a way to bring prosperity to the whole country, to the whole society. He has not said that you should do it because I am very great and I need to feel very great so I want you to offer food to me. No, that is not the context of offering something at the puja. Whatever you offer at the feet of Bhagwan, that is going to start multiplying in your life. And if imagine as a whole society, if people start offering to Mahadeva and then consuming it, how much more good can happen? And he see is he going to eat like is he literally going to come and sit and eat is he hungry that's is that why he's asking you to offer to him obviously not Mahadeva is completion itself he is the whole cosmos he doesn't need your food right if he wants food he will manifest it he's asking you to offer so he can bless you back that is why there is a certain importance for these rituals it is for you it is for your own growth for your own closeness developing your own closeness with the deity. So a lot of times you have this idea that you know devotion is either there or it is not there. But that is not how it works. We can apply the same knowledge also right to our uh, education. Either it is there or it is not there. Are, the more you learn economics, the more you will become better at economics. The more time you spend on, I am just taking a random subject, but you know whatever thing you spend a lot of time and energy on, that part of you will grow. It's the same thing with devotion. The more time you spend in rituals which help you connect with Bhagwan, more that part of you will grow. So that is the science behind puja. Now I come to a very important part of, it, part of especially the Shaivite tradition, which is the Bhasma. Now a lot of us know that Bhasma is very sacred to Shaivites and it is very well loved by Shaivites. But a lot of times what we don't know is Mahadeva has given Bhasma as a very important part of relieving you from all physical diseases and many other mental problems, all types of problems. So <coughs> he has described the Bhasma Snana. Now the Bhasma is prepared from, can you guess what? It is prepared from cow dung. And there is an entire process given. It is called the, there are four or five types of Bhasma which Mahadeva has described. The most sacred is called the Kalp Bhasma. And then he has given other descriptions. I have not put everything into the slideshow because otherwise I'll put the whole agama. I'm giving you a very quick summary. What I'm sharing is at best can be described as a very quick summary of what is there. What I've put is just for reference. It is by no means exhaustive. So what I'm speaking now is not in the slides. So 
Mahadeva has given the process of preparing all these four or five types of bhasma and he has given those in the order of preference. Kalpa bhasma is the most sacred bhasma and he has asked you to smear your entire body with the bhasma in the morning in the Brahma Muhurta and he has given all the benefits of that. So the bhasma snan as it is called can literally liberate you from whatever ills you have in your life. It is a process to literally break your karma and of course he has also said it can lead you to achieving the ultimate. Now, what is this is just the significance of Bhasma itself, what I have put in this slide, which is that Bhasma, of course, he said Bhasma Snana should be done every day. He's explained what all it is, that it is a purifier, it is, uh, you know, what all goods it brings to you. So, just for your reference, I will be making this uh, PPT available to all of you for free if you want to download it later, because this is a lot of references and many people may want to read through it later. So, uh, I'll just upload it after uh, the talk. You can refer to it. You don't need to worry too much about the PPD. I'll, I'll make it available. So, this is the significance of Bhasma. So, you know, the next time somebody says, Oh, you are so beautiful, you are so It is, we are not stupid. You know, Mahadeva does not tell you to do anything that will make you stupid, first of all. So, your own lack of knowledge cannot be translated to stupidity, right? It, if you don't know the significance of Bhasma, does not mean it is stupid. I have seen this and I am not saying this just out of the top of my head. I have seen these kind of comments, not just from, I don't even talk about anti-Hindu elements. I am talking about Hindus. There are many Hindus who don't understand this science and who have not been able to understand the importance of it. So, maybe if they take Bhasma Snana, they themselves can rid themselves of this kind of thought trends. Right? So, the reason why I am going into all these details is so you understand the depth to which Mahadeva has given solutions for all types of problem. He has given solutions for stupidity also. So, he is not the kind of guru who will leave some people outside of his, uh, you know, ambit. He has literally given solutions for all types of people. Now, we uh, come to a very important, again very controversial part of Hinduism, which is the Panchagavya. Panchagavi are the five substances you obtain from a cow. Now, because, uh, you know, you say the word cow and there are people ready to, like, you know, shake you from top to down. That is the reason why I wanted to mention it. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, there was a story a uh, few years ago, I think three years ago, there was this guy who had cancer. And all he did, all medicines failed, doctors gave him, like, you know, a few months at best and he started preparing his funeral. Uh, he wanted to micromanage his funeral because he did not have any hope to live. And then he went to some Ayurvedic place <coughs> and they gave him Panchagavya. And he has described that he did not even have any sense of taste left. That is the extent to which he had cancer. So I didn't even know what I was having. I just kept on having it because I didn't have any options anyway. And he actually got healed from that cancer. And this is not just something I'm, uh, you know, sharing just randomly. You can see there is a book called uh, the how a cow saved my life some it's called something like that the holy cancer how a cow saved my life just search for how a cow saved my life in amazon you'll find his book it's still available yeah he has created uh, uh, i think an ngo called the healing where or some dot org something like that so if you search for those you will find that story it's a very real actual story now what is a panchagavya now, Panchagavya is not just five substances taken and mixed together. That is not what it is. First of all, what goes into Panchagavya is milk, curd, ghee, cow urine and cow dung. Now, Mahadeva has given an entire process for preparing the Panchagavya. Right? He has given all the mantras. How many times you have to chant the mantra? You have to keep all five in separate vessels. He has given what vessels you should be using, all of that. And he has eventually said, that eventually rendered them to be of nectary nature, he should worship them and declare the oneness with Mahadeva. So before you use Panchagavya, you are also supposed to declare oneness with Mahadeva. So of course, this Panchagavya has been mentioned many, 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 many times in the Agama for literally everything from purification of the space where you're going to install your deity to the purification of your house to like, you know, using it in some puja or some anushthan, everywhere the Panchagavya is used. And some places, the constitution of the Panchagavi is slightly different. Uh, he has mentioned that also, where it is slightly different from what is given here. 
<coughs> this occurs in the beginning this is in chapter 4 and some of the later chapters a little variation is given so this is the relevance of the panchagavya and how it is prepared is actually given so i don't know if people use this process anymore but even if just the mixing the substances and using it alone gives you so much benefit you can imagine what will uh, you know what is the benefit you're going to have if you actually prepare it using the process which was given now we come to a very important part which is pran pratishtha of deities now this is some process which most people talk about but not a lot is very commonly understood I'm, i mean of course there are people who do know this but this knowledge is very very important why because pran pratishtha of deities was not just the science of putting a deity there it is not like you just put it pick it up here and put it there no that is not how installation of deities is done in our temples there is an entire this is a 22 step process and if I really start giving you all the details, I'll have to, the whole Uttar Pada of Kamika Agama gives only that. The process for Pran Pratishtha to every deity. And several chapters in the Purva Pada also give just this. So it's a very long process. It is the process of literally making that deity living and breathing. It is not just stone. It is not just wood. If you are using wood, he does mention wood. So he does he mention metal also. So it is not just uh, you know stone or metal. It is literally once you do pran pratishtha, the deity cannot be moved. It has to stay there. It is now that deity's home. It is not your home now. It is that deity's home. So whichever place you install the deity, it is that deity's living, breathing space. The deity has a breathing space, and the space in which that deity breathes is the temple. Right, which is why in if you actually destroy the deity, you cannot do worship to that deity again. And uh, many of you must be knowing, many of the invaders earlier, they used to destroy a lot of our deities. Because then you can't do puja to that deity unless you have again, you know, done some other spiritual processes, which they won't let you do. So this process literally made that deity into living, breathing, who can be an its own independent intelligence. So it was literally Bhagwan made available to you in a way in which you can relate with him. That is why the temple culture was so important. Because the temple was not just one place where some stone is there. Why would you go to the temple? Stone is everywhere, right? Temple has its place. This is a very common logic which people have. Why do we have to worship in the temple? God is everywhere. Yeah, God is everywhere. Can you feel him everywhere? Are you able to relate with him on a personal basis everywhere? Because you are not, that is why we have a temple. <laughs> if you were already able to do that, you would not have temples. Because you are not able to do that. That is, to, for you to realize God is everywhere, you need to come to a place which enables you to do that. Yes, true. First of all, God word is not uh, original to Hinduism. So God is not the correct word, but because it's popularly used, I'm using that word. Bhagwan is everywhere, but because you are not able to realize that Bhagwan is everywhere, you need to go to a place where Bhagwan is literally sitting to make you realize that. So this Pran Pratishtha was a very long process which made the deity into exactly that, living, breathing Bhagwan. Which is why you can't just go and throw anything on the deity. You can't, when, so if you see, you know, all these, uh, especially South Indian temples, all the puja charyas and all the priests who are in the temple, they don't just go and throw things on the deity like that, right? Even if they have to put dresses, even if they have to put mala on the deity, they will do it as if, like, you know, when they put bangles on the deities, on the Devi uh, deity, they don't just like, you know, push it like that. No, if you're doing it on a person, will you push the bangle on them like that? You won't. Because they know, okay, it's a living deity, right? And of course, many people have had many profound spiritual experiences in most of these temples. It is because of this. So this is the whole significance of the process of Pran Pratishtha, which a lot of times people just bypass. So I, uh, this is just for your knowledge. These are all the forms of Mahadeva, Vignesha, which is Ganesha and Shakti, whose Pran Pratishtha processes described <coughs> in the Agamas. I'm not going to read out all. Uh, if you want, you can just refer to it. it this whole process is given in the Kamika Agama. Now, the mudras. Why am I talking about mudras? Now, the mudras were a very important part of our daily rituals, which have been lost almost entirely. 
So, except for maybe the temple priests who do the mudras when doing some of the pujas and stuff. Nowadays, in our daily practice, we don't really see people doing any of the mudras, right? Now, Mahadeva has given mudras for certain processes and he has explained where you need to use them. This is from the Rora Vagama. Now, we have moved out of Kamika to Rora Vagama. Uh, <coughs> so, all these mudras are described and what mudra should be used where. So, I think the only mudra a lot of times we use is the Namaskar mudra. But apart from that, there are many and the Linga mudra which is described is for establishing total identity between the form of Shiva and the Sadhaka. So, similarly many other mudras are given which should be used when you are performing any kind of worship or even chanting some mantras, all these uh, mudras are given for that. So, now I am coming to yoga. Now, the reason why I really wanted to talk about yoga is because most people think that the first time anybody gave the knowledge of yoga was Patanjali who revealed the yoga sutras. Of course, Patanjali's yoga sutras are a treatise and they are really, really important. They share a lot of knowledge, but that was not the first time the science of yoga was revealed. Science of yoga was revealed many, many thousands of years ago by Mahadeva himself, who is the Adi Yogi who is the first yogi. Now, yoga, as for Mahadeva, I will explain many, many important things which are very commonly misunderstood about yoga. But yoga, as for Mahadeva, is to realize yourself as Mahadeva. It is not to feel healthy. It is not a replacement for your gym. It is not a replacement for your morning walk. It is not because oh, I am feeling lazy today, so I will do yoga. No, the purpose of yoga was so you live breathe, exist as, Mahayo, as Mahadeva. Now, he has given six steps. We normally use Ashtang Yoga, but Mahadeva has given Shashtang Yoga. Pratyahara, Dhyan, Pranayama, Dharan, uh, sorry, Pratyahara, Dhyan, Pranayama, Dharan, Tark and Samadhi. These are the six parts of yoga which Mahadeva has given in the Rora Agama. So, he has spoken about yoga in several Agamas. This is not the only Agama, but this is what he has explained in the Rora Agama, where he has elaborated specifically on the dharan and he has explained so in this particular agama he has given different methods in different agamas in this specific agama he has mentioned so many units of dhyana become pranayama so many units of pranayama become dharana so many units of dharana become samadhi so this is the process he has given in this so he has explained what he means by unit like to what capacity you are able to hold that space, right? It's a very lengthy process which I won't go into. Now we come to the Sarvajyana Uttar Agama. He has explained yoga again in this Agama. Now, how should you practice yoga? First of all, before he goes into how should you practice yoga, he says even before you start practicing yoga, you should be established in Dhyan. Meditation, first of all, the word meditation is a later coinage. The word meditation was not used in Hinduism. The word was Dhyan. And what was Dhyan for? Dhyan was bringing your awareness on the form of Mahadeva and realizing yourself as Mahadeva. Contemplation is again a weak word. I don't have an exact word in English for it. But Dhyan, if you understand, bring, awareness is a very close, rough translation. Even before you start yoga, you, the sadhak should be experienced in Dhyan. That is what Mahadeva is given. So, like Mahadeva has not said, if you want, you can do meditation along with yoga. No. Even before you think of doing yoga, you first become established in Dhyan. Means first become established in Mahadeva. Awareness on Mahadeva as Mahadeva. That is what he has said. Then he has said, how should you practice yoga? Now he has said, Maana mano samo kritva, sukha dukhe same tatha. Whether you are abused or you are honored, whether you are happy or you are unhappy, you should still be doing yoga. You should continue with your practice. Because he knew that we human beings go through all this process. Sometimes we feel very happy, sometimes we don't feel happy. Sometimes we feel we are being praised, sometimes we feel we are being abused. So he has already like, you know, overridden all these excuses we always give for not doing yoga. In all these conditions, Harsham Bhayam Vishadam Cha, Satyam Jaya Yogam Abhyaset means the true seeker always continues, keeps up with his practice of yoga. Whether you are happy, whether you are depressed, vishad means depressed. 
right even if you are really depressed you should still keep up with your practice right so this is what he has given as the first the context of yoga now this all this all the modern day yoga studios will not tell you right maybe some do of course i am not i don't like to make blanket state, uh, statements the some yoga teachers may be authentic most are not and that is where the dilution and pollution of yoga starts if you don't know when you should do yoga how you should do yoga this is not all by the way he has explained where you should what kind of a place you should be doing yoga in he has not said that you know you can do yoga anywhere no in your in a secluded place in a forest in a cave in a temple or in an ashram he has given all the list of places where you can do yoga how should you be sitting where should you be sitting what kind of surface it should be which asan should you be sitting in all these details are given now he has given he has mentioned some of the asanas popular asanas which uh, you know you can use he has mentioned padmak swastik ardha peet ardha chandra sarvat sarvato bhadra and so forth so he has given certain asanas in which you should be sitting having assumed a posture agreeable to him he is not saying force yourself into this posture no sit in a posture agreeable to you out of all these keeping his body upright with the head aligned the sadhak should abandon all attachments that is the first thing actually attachments is also not a correct translation he has mentioned sar sangan parityaj sangan means what all that you feel as yours all you think everything you think you own everything you think you belong to all of that you have to first drop all of that why because the purpose of yoga was not fitness purpose of yoga was to be mahadeva how can you be mahadeva if you think oh no this thing is mine and that person is doing this and i'm jealous of this person and i'm angry at that person you you can't right so you have to first drop all of that then he has said be withdrawn into his or her own mind oh guha guha was the disciple to whom this was being given withdrawn into his or own he is not saying go and compare is your asana as good as the other person's asana are you being able to stretch as much as the other person which is what you do in yoga studios are you withdrawn into your own self in your yoga studio half of the times i am a yoga charya by the way i have seen how people do yoga <laughs> most of the times i have to keep reminding them don't bother what the other person is doing only focus on yourself because the awareness itself is not on you how will your yoga be useful you are concerned half of the times people don't even listen what they are supposed to do they are only interested in seeing how perfect their asana is coming out to be of course goal is eventually to achieve that perfection but the you won't achieve that perfection by that comparison and by your mind being all over the place if your mind is all over the place what type of yoga you are doing it's not yoga it is boga right so this knowledge which mahadeva has given is very important not just for you know just doing yoga but for understanding even why you are doing yoga and why should you continue to do yoga so he has emphasized ki atma sansthan bano guha be focused on your own mind don't bother about others then he has mentioned <coughs> how they should be he is given a mool mantra which you should be chanting and the sadhak should repeat the mool mantra of shiva in a perfect way as instructed by his guru why have i highlighted this line two reasons mantras are supposed to be chanted while doing yoga yoga is not a spiritual process it is very much a part of hinduism and as i already explained in the chapter on mantras nothing is to be done without mantra so mantras are supposed to be chanted while doing yoga i have attended a yoga charya training i am a yoga charya and i know that many yoga charyas thankfully i did not do such a training but in many places the yoga teachers themselves say it is okay it is optional if you want you can chant the mantra otherwise you can you know do whatever you want if you don't feel connected you need not know that is not how yoga is supposed to be done as instructed by his guru means what guru is supposed to instruct you on which mantra is to be chanted it does not say as instructed by acharya by the way acharya is different guru is different guru is an enlightened being acharya is someone who has a, an entire end to end knowledge of that subject all of course all these descriptions of who is acharya who is guru is also given Uh, there is a separate tantra kularna tantra in which an entire chapter is dedicated to this i won't go into that too much right now 
but well, the very fact that he has mentioned in a perfect way as instructed by his guru means the guru is supposed to initiate you and tell you how to chant the mantra there are very few gurus who are doing that right now so mantra is supposed to be chanted guru is supposed to initiate you into the mantra and you are supposed to chant the mantra while doing yoga as given by your guru right so i picked out some verses there are of course there is an entire chapter on this i'm not going to don't worry i won't go through the whole thing i'm just highlighting some key points which are very commonly misunderstood having equalized the prana apana having enabled the breath to flow through within the sushumna having arrested the workings of in breath and out breath the well skilled sadhak should deeply meditate on lord shiva so it is not that you can meditate on whichever god you want it is especially not it is not meant for gods of other religions you have to meditate on mahadeva if it is mentioned in some other ragamas that you can meditate on your own aradhya i am okay with that i am not vetoing that if there is some specific instruction in some other literature so there are other literatures there is the hatha yoga pradipika there is gheran uh, samhita where they have given specific instructions but it so happens those are also from the shaiva sampradaya now in this it is at least in the agamas it says you have to meditate on the form of lord shiva so it is not that oh you can meditate meditate on your own form it is not that you can meditate on your best friend right it is not that he is very specifically mentioned you have to remember the deity through the continued practice of this the sadhaka experiences unfailing and inseparable union union with the luminous form so that is what happens when you meditate on lord shiva the reason i am going on harping on this is because all this has been literally torn out of divorced from the current practice of yoga what we know as yoga today is literally one tenth of what was instructed as yoga by the adi yogi right now this is just the concluding part i just wanted to emphasize on the role which the third eye plays in this entire science it is very clearly mentioned how you can awaken the third eye in the agamas it is clearly mentioned a guru whose third eye is awakened who has already become one with the supreme can initiate you into third eye awakening and third eye awakening is the gateway to the higher powers in the vigyan bhairav tantra this specific mantra is given where he has described that there is you will feel a certain flame or light in the region of the third eye arnya chakra and that is what is called the agni tilak or the trinitra tilak which i am wearing because i am initiated so this is also an authentic science many people have questions about this also that is a third eye fiction or is it just some hocus pocus it is not it is very much a living science which many people are experiencing and it is very much available only upon initiation it is not that of course if you work on your third eye your awareness will increase your ability to uh, you know be on in a higher plane of consciousness will increase but to manifest the true powers of third eye you need to be initiated and this is mentioned that who can initiate you all those details are given so this is uh, you know a very quick introduction a very uh, brief summary of an introduction to the shivakamas i can of course go on talking and speaking but i wanted to give you a quick overview of what is contained in the shivagamas why are they important what all can you learn from them and what is the relevance today what is the purpose of shivagamas so these are some of the references from which i have taken the verses uh, which you saw in the presentation and all these are pro properly referenced so you you know there's the verse number chapter number the name of the scripture everything is mentioned along with every verse and i have made all these scriptures also available for download so these are linked so i did not have the time to go and find the original source web link of where to get this from so i just quickly uploaded it in a folder if you want you can download it and read it uh, you can access this presentation from this link um, i'll share it anyway srijan.hinduism.news and uh, all this is um, available from there this is a contact if you want to ask me for the questions so now i think we can take some q and a if uh, we'll